what's up everybody as we know we found out that trials is coming back last night it's gonna be releasing on march 13th super excited about it um i did i did record our reactions to the uh like trials youtube video that we saw last night um so i'm gonna throw that in this video as well but we're gonna be taking a look at the uh, director's cut the first one of 2020 um luke smith writes these they're usually pretty informative and kind of a look into what's going on at bungie and what they're what they're thinking about destiny and why they do the things that they do um i haven't read this at all before uh, recording this apart from seeing a few little snippets on uh, twitter so everything that you see here is going to be me pretty much reading this for the first time um, and reacting and discussing about the way that I um, I feel about it. So let's get right into it. I don't want to keep this video too, too long. Um, so we've got um, an introduction here from Luke Smith. Um, probably don't need to read too much of that. Uh, before we look ahead, let's look back one more one more time. 2019 was about a few things for Bungie and Destiny. Asserting our vision for destiny. It's an action MMO. I love when they use that word. Why? Because the more they use it, the more I feel like destiny is going to move towards what we actually thought it was going to be when we bought this game way back when. Um, that you can play anytime, anywhere with your friends. It's a world we want to keep building on and to do so with creative, with creative and work, work life sustainability. Without our team's talents, there isn't a destiny. And while that seems obvious to say, I think it's pretty easy to lose sight of amidst the this was awesome, this was not so awesome reactions to entertainment. As I covered at length last year, the way we built the annual pass won't work for us over the long haul. We had a lot of help and person power from our awesome and now former partners. We need to find a better way forward while preserving the player experience and our business because we are now self-publishing destiny. So... Uh, I mean, looking at the annual pass from before when Activision was still still involved with Bungie, um, there still was kind of a lack of content. Uh, so that concerns me a little bit because I don't entirely know how they're going to provide enough content on their own um, moving forward. I'm hoping now that we, we have like trials and um, there's a lot of PvE activities in the game right now that are replayable. Um, for example, you've got, you st we still have Menagerie. Uh, I think Sundial is going to be going at the end of the season, but we have like a good amount of raids. Like there's a lot of different strikes and different things. So, um, and I think they're introducing a harder nightfall. So there should be a lot of PVE content and then hopefully like trials and, and comp and stuff will help pull us through, um, the content droughts in between seasons. Cause, uh, yeah. Um, when I think about the total scope of that work and the sheer force of the will, uh, sheer force of will the team demonstrated to deliver in 2019, I feel pretty good about what we achieved. Usually this is where we list all the positives, but instead let's use the word to count a word count to improve on the past and look ahead to the future down. Um, all right, let's skip ahead a little bit here. When I came back from the holiday this year, something about Destiny felt off to me. Season 9 is, to me, the best winter season we've done in Destiny 2, but something felt missing, and that missing element is what I think we need to focus on throughout 2020 and into 2021. Uh, aspiration, a hope or ambition of achieving something, the action or process of drawing breath. In Destiny 2, aspiration is what keeps our game alive. It is the air that fills its lungs. It is the breath that gives the game meaning. Aspiration can be about entering Destiny 2 for the first time and feeling the potential of what you could become. It can be about the pursuits in front of you, or it can also be PvP players looking over the horizon and seeing the lighthouse and its treasures awaiting them if they pass the trials. Aspiration isn't something reserved for the elite or the engaged. It's for everyone. Although when I listen to players express the feeling that there's so much to do and none of it matters, I feel that pain. Good. It's about the potential of a game to be more than something that just fills your time. It's about having goals and working towards something that matters to you. I'm not so naive as to think we can make something that matters to everyone. We all have different values, goals, and time. But I do think Destiny 2 can do a better job of enabling players to set short, medium, and long-term goals to work toward. That, I, I like that. 
Um, because I think it's important that you have things that you can jump in and do in a short period of time, but also things that you're working towards for the, the whole season. Um, I think they've done a really good job with titles, uh, providing, providing titles that you can work, work towards over long periods of time. Um, some of them, in my opinion, have some time gating that is a little ridiculous <laughs> chronicler. Uh, but, um, I do think they've done a pretty good job with, titles and in the video that released earlier today where we talked about season of dawn um we did like pete did mention that the this season's title um savior was much more obtainable than undying um and and i think there's something to be said about not having to like regrind the same content 500 times for a title um because it's not really it's not really fun um as a player aspiration is something i feel so strongly about it's the difference between a game I fall in love with and a game I consume like junk food. <laughs> Last year, we started thinking about aspiration and what is missing from Destiny. The gaping, burning eye-shaped hole is something I'd felt since we set trials aside early in D2. Its return is part of a bigger goal for Destiny moving into 2020 and beyond. We need to refuel aspiration in Destiny 2. And a bunch of what we're going to cover in this edition of the Director's Cut is going to orbit this. Bomb. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling excited. Season, seasons of Change. With a few seasons under our belts in Shadowkeep, we're well underway on internal discussions about how we feel about them. We look at these iterations through a bunch of lenses. First, there's a soft, smushy, how do we feel about seasons? These, seasons are, these feelings are mined from our own experiences and from ongoing roll-ups of information from our community. We also look at how well seasons are engaging our players. Are people coming back each week? How long are they playing? What do, <laughs> what do we look like month over month? And how does it perform against our historical data? Then we start to talk about where to take seasons in year four. Looking back, there's some good stuff and things we need to work on. So they must know that the player base has been dwindling, uh, especially on the PVP side. We've been talking about it for weeks months even that all we do is play the same people the same clans we see the same names in pvp over and over and over again i'm really hoping that in trials it's not the same thing um and i did see somewhere from luke smith last night that trials is going to be connection based and card um card based so basically you're going to be based on your connection to the person as well as where you are on your trials passage or card um, and that's the way that I think it was when we finished Destiny 1. Uh, I think at the beginning it was kind of random. It was connection-based only. And then they moved more towards a card-based experience. Um, which means that when you get to near the end of the card and you're, you're about to hit the lighthouse, um, you are playing other people who are in the same spot, which kind of ups the ante and makes it a little bit more, uh, more intense, more rewarding. Um, so I think that they, they took a good direction with that. Um... I got a little off topic there. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Let's start with what's been working well. Our seasonal narratives are starting to connect to one another. The transition to season 10 with the community getting involved by donating fractaline, fractaline, honestly, I haven't figured out how to say that word, in 100 count stacks accompanied by long buttonholds and lighting the lighthouse was a neat start at players working to move the world forward, ensuring that each story link in the seasonal chain connects to the next and sets up where we're headed. Okay. I do agree that the seasonal narratives are starting to connect to one another better than they did. I do not think that making us donate almost 10 billion fractaline or a consumable of whatever uh, is the way to do it. Uh, and I hope that we don't have to do something like this again next season or the season after or even a year from now because honestly it was slightly ridiculous and if they do make us do something like this again it better be in more than 100 count stacks. I'm just going to say that because that I mean people wasted a lot of time holding X or pressing whatever button on PC. Uh, the save a legend element of Season of Dawn was a nice deep cut for those who have been the death who have been with Destiny since the beginning and a way to introduce the ultimate Titan as Pigeon Superfan slash Guardian. I'm going to mess up that word, so I'm not even going to say it. To many people who hadn't found his grave the first time, seeing your reactions was a highlight, and the team had a lot of fun building this one. Um, 
that was a really cool quest line. Uh, seeing um, save 14, saving save 14, having him become a vendor in the tower. I hope he stays. I don't, I, I don't know whether we're going to get into that in this, but um, I, I'm wondering whether he's going to be the trials vendor, seeing as he's basically sitting on what brother Vance had in D1. Uh, but I would like to see him stay. I like, I like uh, same 14. Um, and I really enjoyed that, uh, that story storyline. I've enjoyed the simplicity of leveling up Destiny's version of a battle pass. We wanted a progression that you could advance just by playing the game. We don't think we've got the whole XP thing figured out. Um, running in and out of lost sectors and farm and flash farming XP isn't what we had in mind, but we can keep tuning it. So I know that there's people that are farming XP that way. Personally, I've just played the game in the, the way I would normally play the game. And I'm almost at 200, uh, seasons pass level, which is double what, uh, you, you need for the rewards. Do we play a lot of destiny? Yes. Um, I like the battle pass. I think that they've gone a good direction with it. Um, I think that having guaranteed high, high stat, uh, gear in it was really good this season. Um, it was nice to know that we, we guaranteed got that. Um, and with the changes to armor affinity and be going to be how we're going to be able to change the element on the armor. I mean, bomb, you pretty much get three pieces that you can customize with ornaments, um, that are guaranteed a certain stat and you can change the affinity now, assuming it stays the, the same, uh, next, next season. Um, strictly speaking about my own play patterns, I feel the need each season to get all of the passes, universal ornaments and the title. I like knowing that those cosmetics are unique and won't be offered again. However, I find myself personally less motivated to try and get awesome rolls for the new weapons, which is especially strange considering I like having a nice version of each gun in destiny. Want to do some weapon stuff now? There's going to be more weapon stuff later on, but let's just chum the waters a little bit. I still really like playing this game. I've acquired almost every weapon in the game. Why Anarchy? You know what? That's the only one I'm missing. That and Hush. And Hush is my own fault. Actually, Anarchy is my own fault too because I've only ran Scourge like twice. I have some pretty slick rolls on a few of them and near miss internet approved god rolls on others. Spare rations, rapid kill clip, and then full bore, and a quick visit to Disappoint Town with Alloy Magazine. Like many of you, I ended up gravitating uh, to a few weapons and just using them instead of everything else. Sure, the outlaw multi-kill multi -kill clip breach light I farmed from Season of Dawn is nice to have, and I love the art for the Dawn weapon set. But is this really going to displace my go-to PvE kinetic weapons? Probably not. I know that. I recently sat with a couple of external folks who really love Breakneck. It's the only thing they use. They aren't ever going to use another primary weapon in Destiny 2. Why? Because they don't need to. Part of aspiration is the pursuit that comes with it, and right now, the way we are and have been treating weapons in Destiny 2 isn't actually fueling the aspiration engine. Back to Seasons. Um, this might be leading into something that I did see on Twitter, which is that uh, legendary weapons are going to be limited in how high you can um, infuse them as far as power. So it's basically going to force you to have to use new weapons as we progress through the seasons for endgame activities. Uh, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling that's what this is leading into. On the other hand, we aren't delivering the feeling of an evolving world. Instead, we are delivering the feeling of... Oh gosh, another word I'm going to mess up. I'm just going to skip it. Private activities and rewards that go away. The Forsaken Annual Pass had its share of challenges, but it also had this awesome property. If I stopped playing for a season when I came back, there were a bunch of rewards and activities I could catch up on. That's fair. Um, I hadn't actually really thought about that because we continuously play Destiny. Um, but for people that are joining later, they don't get the season stuff, which was kind of the point because it's an evolving world. And if you weren't there, you don't get the rewards, but, uh, let's see where they go with this. What we're discussing now, and which is early enough that things might still change is how we focus our efforts around seasons from a development standpoint, while also trying to create the moments that make memories while also balancing the amount of fear of missing out. This is a tricky balance because these elements don't connect neatly. And in many cases they work against one another. Kind of what I was just talking about. 
The wall of text below is how we're thinking about things at the moment. We're gonna be continuing to take in the feedback our guts and data provides. Your reactions and feedback are a part of the data. So do continue to let us know your thoughts on our seasonal model. Before we get into some more thoughts and details, I wanna be extremely clear. This year's version of Seasons has too much FOMO. We wanna fix this and next year's Seasons will have less. Okay. Because we aren't spending our developmental resources and time as well as we could, we're talking about moving away from creating season bespoke private activities and instead using that time to effort and effort uh, to build themes that aren't just represented by a marquee event that will fade away, but rather to inject these seasonal themes into more of the game. Like we continue to evolve the world's narrative, we can invest more in the evolving world of our public spaces and take further efforts to evolve Destiny 2's core activities. Um, do you guys remember when in Destiny 1, uh, SIVA infected um, the EDZ, or it was Earth, the Cosmodrome. Um, it would be kind of cool to see some more of that stuff. Maybe new planets being introduced. I'd love to have Venus back. Um, and and kind of see the, the seasonal like story stuff actually affecting the world. Kind of the way that the Dreaming City um, changes and stuff as well. That'd be kind of cool. I don't know if that's asking too much. Core activities, what are those? Core activities are a way we think about a player's options and motivations in a given evening of destiny. They're meant to be more evergreen. Quest campaign content, for instance, is not generally evergreen. It's usually something match made and designed with replayability in mind, either from the properties of the activity itself or the rewards. For example, Crucible is fundamentally replayable because the opponents can be different and other players are the ultimate AI. This is why I keep saying Crucible is literally the only thing that keeps a good amount of the player base playing throughout the drought of PvE content. Uh, where the ordeal is fundamentally replayable because it's of its reward structure, rather than random encounter generation. In fact, we hope the ordeal is consistent uh, with a given week to create mastery and efficiency in defeating it. I personally have only probably done one Master Nightfall I think I've done two in total between this since it's been out. Um, this is something that we'll probably talk about a little bit uh, later. But um, in general, I just feel like there hasn't, as a PvP um, oriented player, I don't really feel like there has been very much reason for me to um, grind anything to give me extra light. I can do all the raids um, without being max light. I can do all the PvP stuff without being Max Light. I don't really play a ton of Iron Banner because I don't find it very fun. Um, so, yeah. Trials might change that. Ideally, core activities are convergence points for players, player motivations. I want to maximize XP, chase awesome items, and generate, econ and generate economy that I can use to, excuse me, further my goals. Yes, I know no one talks this way. <laughs> right now, our seasonal activities like Sundial compete with the core activities. They have new rewards and award players powerful gear, but they don't provide a bunch of XP. Core activities provide a bunch of XP, but we all feel the pain of how many more seasons will I get uh, the Titan rain catching shoulder pads from the Drifter. What this competition means is that it can be really hard to, to line up a night of optimizing a destiny because you're being pulled in different directions by our design. Interesting. So what could investing more in core activities look like? It could mean more rewards being distributed into these activities, or it could mean taking a theme for a season and using it to galvanize strikes. If we're going to ask players to engage with these activities, we have an opportunity to leverage rewards throughout the season. Imagine the armor sets or sundial weapons being woven into core activity reward pools, or imagine experiences like pursuing roles for sweet weapons that could only be found in a given playlist as an end of match reward, like a crucible IS Luna. I, I would actually be interested in them taking more of this route. This is where I get this weapon. This is where I get this piece of gear. Strike specific loot, bomb. I really hope it comes back. Um, that was really cool. I, I understand they have the stuff in Nightfalls, but like if you could run the strike playlist and have a chance to get a specific gear set or a specific piece of gear or specific weapon just from the normal strike playlist, I think you'd see a lot more people playing them. We also think we could invest more of our development time on our quest lines. Right now, things like Sundial consume team resources and then fade away. Imagine instead that seasonal quest lines like Save a Legend didn't go away in the following season, but instead 
existed until the next expansion releases. That way, as players drift in and out of the game, there's a bunch of content building up for them to play when they return. Interesting. Again, that doesn't really affect us because we play very consistently, um, but it's hard to get a new player or get a player that's gone away to come back if they're not going to have the content to play. Just as we continue to, ev to evolve the narrative of our world, we can continue to invest in evolving the world of open world public spaces. In case you're unfamiliar, these are the spaces where you seamlessly see other players appear. We built a world where players can encounter others, but we haven't made a world with fights challenging enough where you feel like other players matter. Interesting as well. Weapons forever. Okay, we're going to talk about weapons. Um, all the way back to D2 Vanilla, every weapon you get is a weapon you can keep and infuse to raise its power level indefinitely. Remember the waters I talked about chumming later or earlier? Sorry. It's time to eat. <laughs> in Destiny 2, with infusion, it's like having every card you own in Magic available and, all, and playable in all formats forever. It passively creates power creep, an ongoing Destiny problem, which also means our teams need to spend more and more of their time retesting and supporting old stuff instead of making new stuff. It reduces player desire for new items, which dismantles aspiration like the Shard, the Blues, post-Crucible match ritual. <laughs> uh, and it means we ultimately create a ton of gear that doesn't have any value beyond ticking the box of the I got it checklist. That isn't value, it's actually the opposite of value because it's work that we could be putting into making new stuff or improving old stuff. It's big to me that they are um, recognizing that as a problem because think of the amount of stuff you get and just instantly dismantle. I do it all the time. Also, I have like a set of weapons that I use and a set of gear I use. And why would I use anything else? Because that those that that armor has the stats I want. It's got it's got uh, you know everything everything I want on it already. And my weapons, they work. They're the meta right now. Why would I use anything else? Um, you know. So I mean, the and then and then we then we fall into staleness and things which we kind of create ourselves but this should help um our combat team works extremely hard to make weapons feel unique each legendary and many blues get their own flavors of special sauce sometimes it's the way a gun sounds sometimes it's the insanely over budget range stat sometimes it's the recoil pattern sometimes it's the art sometimes it's something indescribable that just makes an item resonate with our players in an action game like Destiny, our weapons are a feel-based extension to the character. I've played MMOs and ARPGs where I get amazing weapons, but rarely have those weapons felt like an extension of my avatar. Certainly in an action game like Dark Souls or Sekiro, the weapons become a feel-based extension of my character, rather than a stat stick like Fang. Um, not entirely sure where Fang came from, I think it's a WoW thing. Pete would know. Remember many, many words ago in previous DCs when I talked about the collision between the action game and the RPG. Couple, couple, with, that, uh, couple with that with our theme of aspiration, and I believe we are approaching an inflection point for weapons and infusion in Destiny 2. Uh, we made a lot of magic cards. I mean, we want you to keep the ones you love in your collection. Uh, and a bunch of those magic cards could be playable around the world while free roaming or in PvP formats, but where power matters or aspirational activities are involved, we're going to make some changes to legendary weapons. So this is what I was saying earlier, where I, I did see something about this on, um, on Twitter. Um, so I'll read, I'll read into it a little bit and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk. Um, so we talked a little bit about a vault of glass here, um, and how the weapons felt very powerful, unique, and rare. Um, and screw it, I'll just read it. If you had Fate Bringer, you probably had a bunch of Ascended Shards to commemorate all the times you didn't get it. I miss those days when power, when rewards were rarer and so special that you celebrated or hated when your friends got one. That's in part because the design of the game gave them space to be different, space to be awesome. It's hard to cleave out that space in the current version of Destiny 2. Weapons that are supposed to come from pinnacle activities like raids or trials don't really have space to breathe. The answer can't, can't be just make them better because that approach ends up with the reckoning situation I described last year. Now, now we had pinnacle weapons, which were largely just challenge, ta sorry, challenge. I don't even know if that's a word. Just talents that had exotic S capabilities in legendary clothing. 
These weapons were typically the result of long pursuits, and when they arrived in your hands, they were pretty strong. Sometimes hilariously strong. Recluse. It also meant the team spent significant time developing each one. If you imagine the abstract weapon space as a pyramid, those pinnacle weapons largely sat at the top of the pyramid. Most other legendary weapons are down in a clump of, they aren't really that different. Why? Because when every legendary item the team builds is going to be around forever, outliers get weeded out. Um, back in 2014, the Vault of Glass weapons could be memorable because we knew they weren't going to be in the ecosystem for things like trials, nightfalls, and raids forever. They'd naturally fall by the wayside because power would make them obsolete. Um, yes. In the world we're imagining, we'll have space at the top end to create powerful legendary weapons. Legendaries that are just better than other items in the classification. We'll be able to do that because the design space for weapons will expand and contract over time. Items will enter the ecosystem, be able to be infused for some number of seasons, and beyond that, their power won't be able to be raised. Our hope is that instead of having to account for a weapon's viability... <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Our hope is that instead of having to account for a weapon's viability forever when we create one, it can be easier to let something powerful exist in the ecosystem. And, th uh, um, and those potent weapons entering the ecosystem mean there's more fun items to pursue. Changes like this also mean legendary weapons or their talents that would be shelved could be reissued at a future date, or it could be brought back in fun ways by involving our community. The more specific nitty gritty for this will come a little bit further down the road, but we wanted to get some of the thinking behind it to you sooner rather than later. The simplest version of how this is going to work is legendary weapons will be fixed values. Uh, legendary weapons will have fixed values for how long they can be infused. Those values will project the weapons viable in end game lifespan. And we think that lifespan is somewhere between nine and 15 months. We're not applying this to exotics. Yeah. So that'll be actually be interesting. I think it's going to be really cool um, to like be forced to find new weapons that we enjoy. Uh, the fact that it's not applied to exotics is important, but uh, it does mean that unless they tune sandbox stuff um, fairly frequently, like Crimson's super strong right now, I can bring Crimson into trials until Crimson's not good anymore. Uh, so there has to be good legendaries that will make me want to use other hand cannons after spare is no longer really relevant in end game stuff. Um, we'll see how they, they deal with that. Cosmic gardeners last year, we said we want playing destiny to feel like you're playing in a game world with true momentum, a universe that's going somewhere, a game where things are happening, not just in terms of new items and activities, but also in terms of narrative. It's frequently seemed like destiny was treading water in terms of moving the world's narrative forward. We want to tackle this in destiny 2's third year. <laughs> The statement is still true for us today as we look into Destiny 2 Year 4 and beyond. We started this in Year 3, but the job isn't done. By its very nature, this is something that really doesn't have an end. The idea of building a narrative that is moving the story of your guard guardians um, forward, creating a universe where permanent change is possible and where players can have meaningful impact is still a thing we're chasing and experimenting with. Honestly, it's something that I think is kind of tough to get perfect. Like, uh, I think they've done a lot of tweaking and a lot of changing in the way that they've worked through the narrative and seasons and um, expansions and different things. And I feel like they're, they're constantly getting better. So um, yeah, we'll see where this year takes us to get there. Change is going to be inevitable. Um, we've said before the destiny Two cannot keep growing indefinitely. There's lots of reasons why this is true. Some technical and some creative because the story wants to push into new areas. Uh, on the technical side, I come back to sustainability. As new areas, features, and event types are added to Destiny, the problems of maintenance grow accordingly for the team. This introduces risk and a big, big burden on our team to maintain that legacy content. In practical terms, it also prevents us from responding to players who have had problems as quickly, quickly as we'd like. Seasons can do some of the heavy lifting here in the sense of giving players a sense of, of shared purpose and understanding of what they're looking for. But when we ready expansions, it's a chance to make some more fundamental changes to the game, world, and its systems. We've done significant system changes to all Destiny games every time every time we've shipped an expansion, and now we're going to be making more changes to the game world as we go forward. We're getting towards the end here, but before we wrap up, here's a quick a few quick hints. Faction rallies. 
Lots of folks have been wondering if faction rallies will return. We have no plans to bring back faction rallies. The reward gear hasn't been used that much. Our character cast is growing too large, and crucially, they didn't drive a bunch of engagement with the game. That said, there's some sweet looks into the gear we're moving... Uh, some sweet looks in that gear, and we're moving the faction rally armor to the legendary and grand reward pools in Season 10. Kind of disappointed there's not going to be anything really going on with factions. Felt like we had factions in D1, and in D2, there are none. What happened to them? They have their sections, but, like, nobody's there. There's nothing happening. Um, we spoke about this a little bit in Discord uh, earlier today. I really would like to see factions come back the way they were in Destiny 1, where they're around all the time, um, and you you have, like, seasonal rotating faction gear, uh, and you can pledge to one per character or even one per account, grind out that gear, maybe switch, um, raise your rep by playing any activity you want. And it would be really neat if there were faction wars, you know, maybe once a season. Um, I understand they have to put their resources where it's important. That's just my opinion. I think it would be kind of nice to have that. Um, bright engrams. For season 10, we're doing away with bright engrams as purchase purchasable items. We want players to know what something costs before they buy it. Bright engrams don't live up to that principle, so we'll no longer be selling them. Whatever. I've never bought a bright engram. New Light, new intro. Our goals for New Light last year were about bringing new players to the universe and getting them to the core activities as quickly as we could. Uh, we dramatically underestimated how many new Guardians would wake up on the Cosmodrome. We're going to improve the New Light entry this fall. <clears throat> Bomb. Because lots of people come in and they have no idea what's going on with New Light. And I haven't played it. And it's not the, the same as what we played. And I don't even know what to tell them. Quite frankly. Um... I feel like I need to make a new light account and play so that I understand where to tell them where to go because it's apparently it's very confusing. Uh, quest log. There's another round of changes coming out with season 10 for the quest tab. Oh, the number of quests you have at any given time sure can feel daunting, especially for procrastinators. So we're adding a new feature to the quest tab categorization. All quests are automatically assigned a category and this buckets them into a specific area. Uh, exotic quests will have their own category, seasonal quests, etc. That's kind of cool. I like that. Um, we're into 2020. We've got some cool stuff planned. Season 10 is entering orbit. There will likely be more talk about it as the calendar continues. Cool. Overall, guys, um, lots of good stuff here. I, I do really like reading these. Uh, this is the first time that I've, I've read one live and, and commented and recorded this. This is all one chunk, by the way. I'm not really editing it, so... I'm sorry for any mistakes that I made or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I think it went okay, though. And I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you guys would like to discuss, we can discuss in stream at Mixer.com slash Pete. We're there every day but Tuesday. Tuesdays we're on Twitch at Twitch.tv slash Pete. Um, so, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, I'm very, really, really, really looking forward to the new season on March 9th. Don't forget, we have uh, two... Uh, tournaments before then one this upcoming saturday on uh february 29th and one on march 7th both of them are going to be starting at 1 p.m eastern they are the playoff tournaments for the bxp league which is the 3v3 clash league we've been running so if you guys are looking forward to uh watching the uh watching the league come to a close this saturday and next saturday is your time um and yeah let's let's go into next season strong guys we're gonna be here we're gonna be doing uh trials help i'm super excited about it um, I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. I hope everybody has a fantastic day and, uh, I'll see you guys in stream. Peace. Oh, oh. snap.
That's it. Goodness, here we go. It? We lighted the beacon. At least two friends. All the time. And so I knew this 3v3 thing was coming. And so my two, two like buddies and I, we would play threes for hours every night. Every night. And I didn't tell them what we were doing, you know, because you can't, you kind of want your friends to experience it the way that, the way that players are going to. But I was like, oh, we're doing this thing. In my head, I'm like, we're doing this thing. So I want to, like, get the communication down, get used to playing with everyone. And we played for hours, hours and hours and hours of threes back in the day. And then Trials came out. And Trials was our Friday. And an ad place. Every week, Trials, you know, we played. But it was this time where you're like, oh, I have this thing to look forward to. I have this thing to look forward to every week. This like sweaty, stressful, high stakes activity. And right now, we are missing that. And yes. I know we're missing it. I know we are missing it. We are going to fix it. <laughs> we are going to fix it. Pete. Babe, you had this clicked on still. Sorry. So the, bar, the okay. bar was up. Oh my God, the armor! No land? Back, and it's pretty insane. Anomaly! Exodus Black, Exodus Blue, sorry. Cauldron. We knew that Trials was coming back. The most important thing from us was to do it right. And so that means it's it's taken us a little while. Every single light, Cauldron. every single round, ah. every single match means something in Trials, whether you win or lose. That was light level enabled as well. Win. Fight again. This is your duty. When you've got the best players in an arena and it's power enabled, the stakes are incredibly high. Power it is enabled. A legitimate, difficult thing to be good at. With the reintroduction of Trials of Osiris, we are really taking a look at our whole sandbox and saying, like, okay, what is the right balance of things? We want to make sure that we really stick the landing with Trials. It's important that this doesn't go out half baked. We are in the playtest lab every day playing Trials, trying to get it just right. We've been working to balance uh, you know, the abilities, the subclasses, the weapons, the armor, to make sure it is as fun and as fair as possible. We've done a lot because it's important. Oh my god, a spare on X is blue. Amazing maps from Destiny 1, some of my favorites personally. Cauldron. Exodus Blue and Anomaly. Some of the coolest armor and weapons from I Destiny wish One, that in my opinion, were the Asylum was on there, but that's okay. This set. will be a new season. And, coming back. and when players go flawless, yes. those armor pieces and weapons I just saw a touch of malice. In a certain way. When you see someone in the tower, everybody's gonna know. Everyone's gonna know that they went flawless that week. It's just oh, simple to have sick. Like a pinnacle PvP That's cool. return. That's what we're, we're hoping for. Players, we feel it ourselves, and I can't wait to bring back a version of Trials that matches what we remember from back in Destiny 1. Go. You make me proud. March 13th. Less than a month, yeah. guys.